ground and I did eat it. And it was the joy and the rejoicing of my life. What an amazing, an amazing verse. Listen, when we find this, when we find God's word, we are to consume it. And not just, not just let it be a part of our head. No, put it down deep on the inside of you. Digest it. What does the cow do? Choose cud. Yeah, which is what one of the things that I've heard about the, the phrase meditation, right? When the Bible says to meditate upon the word, the word that you put on the inside of you, bring it back up and chew on it for a little bit. Ooh! Hey, y'all ready for the word tonight? Well, I'm so pumped. I know a little bit about what they're going to share, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be absolutely incredible, amazing. And uh, would you please stand, if you're able to stand, and give honor to whom honor is due. Would you please help me make welcome my amazing wife, Lauren. And her, yes. Okay. Here's what's on my heart to share with you all tonight. This is really just, if I can just open up the pages of my heart to you about where I am currently living, that's what tonight is about for me. This is, and I, I want to like, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about prayer. I'm going to talk about simple devotion. Um, and, you know, here I am, I've been serving the Lord for as long as I can remember, but, you know, really seriously serving the Lord since I was 15 years old. I think I was 15, maybe it was 16. I think it was 15 when I crossed line. So I've been serving the Lord for a long time, and I still, here this week, feel like the Holy Spirit's circling me right back around to pray and read your Bible, just those steps of simple devotion. And so as I am sharing all of these things, I just, I want to just like right from the top. I want you to know my heart to, to tell all of you, if you hear this and you're like, is she thinking that I don't pray? Or is she saying that I don't have a real walk with God? Please hear my heart. That is not, that is as far away from the truth as it can be. This is what the Holy Spirit is speaking to me right now. So I'm just really opening up the pages of that to you guys and hope that you can just learn or glean or just see somebody who's walking this thing out, walking out a real walk of faith with Jesus. So let's jump in. I want to tell you about a fabulous book that I started reading this week. Hey, look at there. <laughs> it is written by my husband. <laughs> I did read this book before. This book was released, was it 2010, 2011? So this book was... 2012. So almost 10 years ago, this book was released. I promise you I read it then. But this week, this past week, I just picked it up again. And I'll tell you too, whenever we were praying about moving here last year, uh, the Holy Spirit gave Samuel a dream and it actually involved this book. And in the book, uh, there was lots of parts of the dream, but I'll only share just this one part. He was uh, building this wall and he was using stones, and inside of the stone, whenever he opened it up, there were copies of Simple Devotion. And so I do feel like this is a relevant word for this community of people together, um, even though it's simple. And again, I just wanted to let you know, I'm not saying that y'all don't pray. I mean, we have noon prayer, you guys come. There's six o'clock prayer every Thursday night, uh, at ISO, you guys show up for that. Like pretty much everybody goes to prayer. So believe me whenever I tell you, I believe you guys pray. I see you pray. So I know that you have a real walk with the Lord. This is just another step in that journey. Okay. Will you take that with me and believe me that I love you and believe that you pray? All right. So I was picking this book up just to kind of go back through it. And I was going to share it youth on Friday night. And I started just reading it. And I was like, man, this is a good book. Yes. <laughs> I am really impressed with this book. This is like helping me right now. But, you know, the introduction of it, it says this. 
the, the introduction is called Nobody Prays. Hear me, hear my heart. But this is what was challenging to me. It, it says, you know, we assume that everyone prays. We just assume because it's such a normal part of the Christian life and we all talk about it and, you know, pray. Would you pray over my brother-in-law and sister? Yes, oh, I'll be praying for you. We just assume that that means everybody prays, that this is something that everybody does. It's a regular part of everybody's walk. When the real truth of the matter is, I don't, I don't know that it really is the truth for all of the believers in the body of Christ, I think everything would look a whole lot different if it was, right. you know? And so my question tonight is not, do you pray? My question to you tonight is, when do you pray? When do you pray? Now, I live a busy life. I have three kids that I'm trying to rush around and get ready every morning and um, try to stay healthy and work out and all of those things. And it can be so challenging to find the right time to pray. Do I pray in the morning whenever my mind is fresh or do I go and let all of the things get done and then I'll pray at night? There's just like, how, when is the best time to find to really pray? Um, and so that's really, that's the challenge that I think we all live in because everybody has that exact same story. You've got your morning routine and a lot of us do devotion or something like that. But when do we really enter into a time of fellowship and communion with God where we're not just on the clock, we're not just clocking in our time. It's just, it's a real time of connection with the Holy Spirit. And that's a challenge to me. Can I be really open and honest to say that that's a challenge to me? that it's a challenge to carve out regular, consistent, committed time to pull away and connect with God like that. Now, corporate prayer is powerful and needed. And we do that, like I mentioned before, there's the six o'clock Thursdays, there's noon on Tuesdays here. We do a lot of the corporate prayer and we'll probably implement more corporate prayer. There's not too much corporate prayer that you can implement. But what about that private time of pulling away? Why do we need to do that? Let's look at Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 6. And you guys know it, but it's just, it's so important to just stop and just think. That's what I've been doing this week. Just stop and think. Do I really do this on the level that I'm supposed to do? But whenever you pray, go into your innermost chamber and be alone with Father God, praying to him in secret. And your father, who sees all you do, will reward you openly. And I'm going to just read the, the next part, too. When you pray, I love this. Do you know how much pressure this takes off? When you pray, there is no need to repeat empty phrases, praying like those who don't know God, for they expect to hear God to hear them because of their many words. There's no need to imitate them since your father already knows what you need before you ask him. Here's what that means. All oh, this is so exciting and wonderful to just even think about. When you pray, these are the words of Jesus. When you pray, you go away into a quiet room, and then you know what? You don't have to pretend to be like anybody else that you've ever heard pray. All of those professional prayer people that sound like they can call fire down from heaven and just manifest presence and glory right there on the spot, on demand, you don't have to sound like any of them to touch the heart of God. That's what Jesus is saying. Not that, not that they pray vain, repetitious prayer. That's all within, between them and the Lord. You don't have to even think about that. But you also don't have to hold yourself up to that kind of a standard to say, God, if he's going to hear me, he expects me to say thee and thou. And then he, or he expects me to sound like I'm screaming at things. I don't know that I have that in me. Sometimes, you know, there, sometimes you pray loud. Sometimes you pray quiet. Here's the thing is you just get to be yourself in the presence of your father. That's the really beautiful thing is all the pressure is off. You close the door and the only one that has to know what you sound like in prayer is you and the Holy Spirit. And there's just no pressure. It's just easy. You can just talk to him. Well, what do you say? What do you say to God? Well, let's, let's look at actually two verses. I'm going to go to Psalm 55. Psalm 55. 
I didn't give you this one, Abigail. I apologize. 55.22. And then we're going to go to 1 Peter. It says, so here's what I've learned through it all. Leave all your cares and anxieties at the feet of the Lord, and measureless grace will strengthen you. Leave all your cares and anxieties at the feet of the Lord, and measureless grace will strengthen you. So, what do you say whenever you go into this secret place of prayer and you close your door, and it's just you and God, and it's quiet, and there's not a big band playing to create an atmosphere it's just quiet and it's just you and God that's really a scary time you know you pour out your whole heart your cares and anxieties you just tell them what's going on in your life you just pour it all out and let them hear you you'll be shocked at the measureless grace that is poured out over your life just by taking the time to pull away and give it to the Lord. And then let's look at 1 Peter 3. First, sorry, 1 Peter 5. It says this. If you bow low in God's awesome presence, he will eventually exalt you as you leave the timing in his hands. Pour out all your worries and stress upon him and leave them there, for he always tenderly cares for you. And then let's go ahead and look at this next part too, because this is important. Be well balanced and always alert because your enemy, the devil, roams around incessantly like a roaring lion looking for its prey to devour. Okay, so this is in the context of pouring out all of your worries and stress upon the Lord, leaving them in a place of prayer, staying alert, being balanced. Why? Because the devil is looking for people who he can devour. Now, in the book, the, really the basis of the book is centering around a dream that Micah, Pastor Micah's wife, Delena, had years ago. So let me tell you the dream, and it's an interesting dream, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of what it's about so that I can explain this next part of what's on my heart to share with you. So in the dream, Micah comes to Delena, and he's having pain in his right big toe. And he tells Delena, I'm going to have surgery to have my toe removed. And she was saying, why do you need to have surgery? He goes and he has surgery, but in the operation, whenever he came out, he was in a lot of pain and they had taken not only his big right toe, they had also taken a part of his heel. And it was wrapped up in bandages and that was the whole of the dream. So what was really, what was really interesting is they said that Micah shares in the book that later on that day, so Delena shared the dream and he's like, that was an odd dream. Move on. Well, that day, um, he went to Arsim to teach. And I want to just read, this is in Micah's words. Initially, I found my wife's dream interesting, but didn't give it too much thought. However, the Arsim classes that day unfolded its interpretation. When I arrived at the ramp to teach, an instructor was scheduled before me, so I listened in. The class referenced Exodus 29, where Aaron and his sons are consecrated. To consecrate them, Moses takes the blood of a ram and puts it on the right ear, right thumb, and right big toe of Aaron and his sons. Of course, when I heard that, my mind went immediately to my wife's dream, the big toe. So, this was the consecration of Aaron and his sons of the priesthood. And the way that they just work out this dream and how it unfolds into simple devotion is that that represented the consecration in their walk with God. Their, the big, their thumb represented their consecration for their hands of service. Anointing the right ear represented consecrating their ear to hear the word of the Lord. But then their right toe consecrated their walk to walk consistently with the Lord. What does that look like for us and what does that mean for all of this and how does that play out even with the, the heel involved? So he connects the big toe and the big heel because he talks about how the Achilles heel is the weakness, right? You've heard about, it's a Greek myth. I don't be believe me whenever I tell you I don't believe in the Greek myths, okay? So we can like write that off, but there was 
a warrior in Greek mythology named Achilles, and that's where the Achilles tendon is named after, and that's also a phrase that we use to describe a weakness, right? If you have an Achilles heel, that's your weakness. So he talks about in this book how that walk with the Lord, your consistent prayer and reading your Bible, just that simple devotion is the Achilles heel. That's the weakness. Now, what is the enemy after? He's after our weakness. He's after the areas that we have allowed to become weak. And so that's where Achilles, as a warrior, had to do, make extra precautions to protect his heel because that's where he was the most vulnerable, right? So if you know that your weakness is in this one area, then you have to shore up and strengthen this area. Now, what I'm telling to you, what I'm saying to you is prayer is our Achilles heel. It's the area that really, it's just the most easy to become very weak in, to let those things just take over your life. Have you ever really tried to make a time for prayer? Whenever we do that, everything comes crashing in on our lives. Anything that could possibly take that time of prayer away from you will happen. It will happen. It will show up. Something will fall apart. It's like something invades on that time of the day and all of a sudden you can't pray. Or you get in there, you pray for five minutes, you're done, and it's like, I, I can't do this. Something takes over. I don't know if you guys saw it, but in like 1989, if y'all were Karen Wheaton fans, did y'all see Satan, you're a liar? Can I see your hands if you ever saw Satan, your liar? Oh, my heart's broken. Oh, yeah, that's right, Braden. You were born in Indiana. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> Y'all have not seen Satan, you're a liar. I feel like we need to find this on YouTube and like post it or something. This was gold. This is like 80s gold. This is also my childhood. Can I just give you the premise of it real quick? Oh, okay, so mom would be sitting in the middle of the stage and what's really funny is she would pull somebody out of the audience to play the devil. So, or, or some random person, she would just like pull some random person. She was traveling, doing concerts. She would just pull like, I need you to be, she would do two different skits. She would pull one to be Jesus and one to be the devil. Oh my gosh, so many memories right now. But she would train them and she would just say, listen, every time I say Satan, you're a liar, you just fall to the ground, okay? And she would kind of give them the, what she needed to do. So mom would come in, she would have this chair set up and she would walk in and sit in the chair and try to do a Bible study and prayer. Well, as soon as she sits in the chair, here comes the devil in full devil garb and he's walking around her and playing with her mind and doing all of this and mom's just sitting in the chair and she's got her Bible open and she's just trying and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty through God. I forgot to go get that book from the library. I've got to go get that book. Oh, where was I? But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and Oh my goodness, I, am go I totally forgot to call her back. Got to call that woman back. And so her mind just trails off. So the whole thing is, the devil is just like over here playing with her mind. So all of a sudden, in the drama, mom realizes what's going on. And she stops and she looks with this like of authority, this thing of authority comes over her. And she starts singing this song, Satan, You're a Liar. It's 80s gold. You've got to go watch this. And she starts say, singing this song, Satan, you're a liar. And every time she says it, he falls to the ground. And I'll just tell you one more funny story about this. There was this one time we were in a hotel ballroom. And uh, at the back of the church, you had the exit doors. And then one door went straight into the kitchen. The other door went straight into the lobby. At the end of the song, she's, every time she says, in the name of Jesus, I command you to flee. And Satan takes off running down the aisle, but instead of going into the lobby, he burst into the kitchen <laughs> where the ladies were in there preparing the after service meals. He heard like screams <laughs> and dishes falling. <laughs> so 
Satan, you're a liar. I always called him Uggy. Hey, so I was really little. So to me, the devil was Uggy. Hey, anyways, but it's still so relevant. That's, that is what happens whenever you try to put a set aside time to pray, to really set that side time aside and just sit with the Lord and focus, what happens to your mind? It's an onslaught of just all of the things that you forgot to do come rushing back to you. It's a miracle. I don't remember who said it, but they said, always keep a, just a piece of paper in your prayer, in your prayer closet, because while you're praying, you'll remember things. Just write it down. Oh, thank you. Write it, done. Focus back in. So, you know, What's really great too about the book is we all, I feel like every one of you in this room feel called to the radical life, the radical life of discipleship. And you know, prayer doesn't really look that radical. Sitting in a room by yourself that's quiet does not look radical. Um, just talking to the Lord like you'd talk to anybody else, it does not feel radical. It does not feel that really supernatural or anything exciting. And usually fire doesn't fall from heaven in my personal prayer time anyway. Um, you know, but we all feel this call that our lives have significance. Every single person in this room feels that. You wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't feel there's something on my life that I can't just settle for normal. I just, I can't do it. I would have to, there would be a part of me that would have to completely die for me to settle for life as normal. I would feel like a shell of a human being that just goes through the motions and feels nothing. There's just so much more in you than that. You know that, I know that you feel that. And so how do we answer the radical call of Jesus to follow him? And the answer is simply in simple devotion just walking with God, keeping that heel shored up, this place of weakness. And I know you feel like maybe, well, it's not, it, I just, I want to encourage you if it's, if you feel strong in this area or if you feel weak, this is a weak area that we have as believers. This is an area that's attacked a lot. Your prayer life is going to be attacked. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. Why? Because the enemy is like a roaming lion, seeking whom he may devour. This is an area that you, we all have to just shore up and make sure that that time with the Lord is protected. I can't be more committed to my workout than I am to my prayer life. I can't be more committed to anything than I am to my prayer life. And so that's, where, that's what I feel. I feel like that's how we answer the radical call of Jesus. It doesn't always look extraordinary and there are not always spotlights on us. It's not always worthy of the gram. It's not always something that you wanna post about, but it's the most radical thing that you can do. Why is it radical? Because we assume that everyone prays when really not many people pray. And so it really is, the radical life really, really does look like walking with God in simple devotion, just praying and reading your Bible and letting him not just fill the nooks and crannies of your day whenever you have a minute here and a minute there, but really setting aside that time that says, Lord, there's nothing more important than you for this time. This time is yours. And that is how we answer the radical call of Jesus. is a big deal. This is a huge deal. I mean, when you really think about it, we had the opportunity to talk to God, the creator of the whole universe that's still expanding because he never told it to stop. And somehow, and actually he's holding just the whole world in his hands everything, the universe. He knows every star and we're just somebody on this planet and he knows us and he hears us and he wants to talk to us. It's a big deal. It's a big deal to not only get to talk to God, but he likes to talk back. It's 
beautiful. It's one of my favorite verses. That when we pray anything that's according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, then we can be confident that he's going to answer us. It's a big deal to talk to God and have him talk back to us. And we just use it as this mundane thing. Maybe I'll make, I'll make time for it. It's a big deal. I don't want to just pass it by. I don't want to just listen to these practicals and go, well, yeah, I'll, I'll try to fit that in my schedule. No, I want to take hold of everything Lauren just said and put it to use. We can see things change in our lives, in our families. If we just get to the basics of simple devotion, spending time with Jesus. Wow, like God, he wants to spend time with us. That we don't have to be far off anymore and send some priest in and bring our lamb. No, no, no. It says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And it says everything is naked and exposed before him. He knows the hearts of men and yet he wants to talk to us. It's a big deal. So this is where I've been. <laughs> this just invitation to simple devotion all over again. And I just want to thank, or I want to say you're welcome to Lauren, because I have been digging into Samuel's book for a while now. And she said, I forgot how good this was. was. It's been a few years. I'm like, yeah, you're welcome. That's your husband, but his words, but they're good. I told you so. But it, it's just this invitation that... I feel that we can just really draw into. I was talking to my friends, I, and I told them, I feel like there's this invitation for us right now, and we can either lean into it, or we can let it just pass us by. I want to lean into it. I'm not going to miss it. I refuse to miss it. You know, since we moved to Cleveland, you know, I've been praying, you know, God save Cleveland, like sin revival. Like we want to see you, God. I want to get closer to you, God. And you know how he's answered me? He's answered me with dreams and visions and words about showers and baths. And it's like, I was wanting to see like all these salvations in my dreams and like masses of people and stadiums. No, I got showers and baths. So one of the first dreams I had that I want to share with you is um, we were actually, it was me and Kaylee at Miss Karen's house, and she has this huge bathtub in her bathroom, and it was full to the brim, to the very top of water, and she was saying, girls, I mean, you know how she talks, girls, you've got to get in this bath. And I said, oh, no, I've heard of Miss Karen's bath. I was like, okay, okay, we've got to get in this bath now. Like, now is the time we've got to get in this bath. So that was one dream. Then, I think it was maybe like a week or two before that, I had a, a different dream. And in this other dream, Miss Karen was up in the front. We were all on stage. It was kind of conference. And we were just having a hard time really breaking through. It was almost like we were hitting the ceiling. And a room full of people. And Miss Karen stops everything, says nothing to no one, looks at all of us and says, let's go. And we head to the back. And in the back were just showers set up everywhere. And she said, let's go. Didn't explain anything to anybody. Just, we're going to take a shower. And, you're, and it's like, God, I'm, where's the salvation? It's all the people coming to the altar, showers and baths. Like, what is this? But... You know, after really praying into it and just, I mean, it's pretty obvious that he, <laughs> about just cleansing ourselves, just getting ready. But then I really started digging into this, and I just feel like it's just the washing of the word. It's simply, it's the John 15, it's John 15, 3, for you have been made clean by the words I have spoken to you. It's washing ourselves in the word of God. And I know that's really simple. I know that's really practical. But when I've prayed for revival, that's what he showed me. Because if we want to get there, we can't go with all the stuff and carry all our baggage, all of our dirt with us. I want to go somewhere I have never been before, and I can't take all the dirt, all the stuff with me. 
So it's the washing of the word. It's the simple devotion every day. I want to be made clean by you. And just like we shower or we bathe, it's an everyday thing. It's not a once the week thing. I hope it's not for you. For either way, (laughs) spiritually or physically, I hope it's not once the week. It's every day. And this weekend we were at Ohio Ramp and I was I was rooming with Kaylee and she's like, Are you gonna shower? And it was you know, we had traveled all day and you know, conference or conference that night or service that night. I was like, I don't know, I'm just so tired. She was like, No, you need to shower. I was like, Noted. <laughs> Going right now. But it's what Lauren was saying. It's all these things get in the way, and I'm just kind of tired right now. And Samuel, I've heard him say this a million times. If you want to go to sleep and you're having a hard time sleeping, just start reading your Bible. You'll go to sleep really fast. (laughs) But it's like it's all these things. We get tired. It's to this. It's to that. It just gets in the way. But it's just like showering or bathing. We need it every day because we live in a world You know how the world looks right now. We've got to make sure we are clean and set apart and that we are a bride that is pure and holy without spot, wrinkle, or blemish ready for the bridegroom. It's time to get ready. He's coming, and I want to be ready. And, you know, the way the world works, well, not the way the world works, the way the enemy works is... He's worked the same way since the beginning. It's the way he works now. We have so many people confused about what the word of God says. And ultimately, I think it's more of a distraction than anything to get get our focus off what we're really supposed to be looking at and just arguing with one another. No, it says this. No, it says this. But for me... I'm really black and white. Like, there's a line. This is right. This is wrong. Do this. Don't do that. But the enemy has worked the same way since the beginning. So when Eve is in the garden and God says, you can eat from anything in the garden, just not the one tree. Don't eat from that. It was clear, right? Clear. Don't do this. Do this. But then the serpent comes in and just very subtly just... Did he really say that? Is that what God really said? And Eve, Eve replies, well, we can, we can eat from any of the trees, just not that one. Then the serpent takes it one step further and says, well, that's not what God really meant by that. He just wants to keep you from seeing. It's the same way it works today. The exact same way it works today. Don't do this. Do this. But did God really say that? And we have a whole generation of people that just know what their pastor said or what their influencer said, and they don't know what this says, so they're not sure. And it's like, I don't know. Did God say that? I don't know. Then the serpent comes just a little step farther and just takes what the word of God says and just twists it just enough that man. And it says, and then she says, she was, it says she was confused. We've got a whole generation of confused people because they're just hearing everybody's voices, but what the word of God actually says. You've got to have this in your heart. You've got to know it for yourself. And I'm not preaching this at you. I'm preaching it to myself. Basically, I'm letting you into my my little journal private time with God. This is what he's been speaking to me. It's real fun here lately. I'll tell you that much. Real fun. Love it. We have got to know. Because there is an enemy. There is an enemy that's been doing the same thing. What blows my mind is he has not changed his tactics. He's still doing the same thing, and we're still letting him do it to us. Why? Because we don't know what it says for ourselves. 
This pastor could say, we believe this. And we're like, yes. This pastor will tell you, well, we believe this. Yes. And then you're just kind of somewhere, yes. Two totally different things, but somewhere, yes. And you don't know. And then it's confusion. It's like, what? Did God really, did God really say that? And the thing about the word of God, it's not just what we want it to say. It is final authority. It is the living word of God. It's not what we just feel it should say. It's not taking a verse and twisting just enough to make it what we want it to be. What we want it to say so we can stay comfortable and where we are in life. This is not supposed to make you comfortable and cozy. I mean, some verses are, but if you are where I am right now, like, I feel like I'm getting deep showered, poked, prodded, <laughs> everything I can by, be by this. But you know what? I know it's because he wants to take me somewhere. And I'm not going to let anything hold me back from that. So it's not just what we want it to say, because I feel like in the world today, we have so many people saying, oh, or even not just what we want it to say about us, what we want it to say about him, what we want it to say about God. What, we have these preconceived ideas about God. That's not really even God. I've, I'm in classes right now. And I have thought of verses that I've heard people say, and I go to find them, and I'm like, they're not even verses. <laughs> like, they're just things that the church people, we just say as the church. And it's like, whoa, that's scary that I'm about to be 24 years old, and I believe these were verses my entire life, and they're not in there. It's just religion, just church, just what people have said. Not to say that's bad. We got to make sure we're right, that we see God rightly, that it's not just what we feel and what we want. And that's really where I've been is digging into this more than ever and finding out I really don't know a whole lot. I don't know. I've, I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in church my whole life, loved Jesus, never wanted to do anything more than preach and sing, and singing didn't work out for me, so here we are. <sighs> I really still want to, but I'll show grace and mercy to you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's a blessing for you. But I've all, so I've always wanted to do something for, for the kingdom of God. I just wanted to do something for Jesus my whole life. And I loved him. And I'm just finding out that all this time I've spent with him, I, I'm going to spend all of eternity searching him out. And I'm probably never going to fully wrap my brain around it. I know I'm not. That's why we've got to be in this. Because no matter where you are in life, whether you're 9 or you're 90, there's always more to know. Because what I'm really finding out is the kingdom is not what I think it is. The kingdom of God is so different from the kingdom of this world. And that's what I've really been searching into. It's like, I want the kingdom of God to come, but what if it's here in front of me and coming and I don't see it because I don't know what the kingdom of God really looks like? Whoa. What if it's right in front of me and I'm offended by it? Because I don't know what the kingdom is actually supposed to look like. Because in the natural, it would be really easy to say, or just, you see in the natural, you see um, something like strength. You think the Hulk, you think, you know, anger and growth. And, but in the kingdom, strength looks like joy. It's like, What? When everything should be making you blow up and you still have joy, that's strength in the kingdom. Whoa. 
When everything's weighing down on you and you're in the midst of turmoil and you're still standing in joy, that's strength. In the, in the world, making it and gaining everything, like, that, like to have everything, to have success, it's the big houses, it's the car, it's the perfect family. But in the kingdom of God, the Bible says to sell all, sell all of it, leave everybody. Whoa. To sell everything, give it to the poor. That's success in the kingdom. We have this paradigm of the American dream, and we think that's God's perfect will for all of us. When the will of God, when he literally says the opposite. I'm not saying we can't have houses and cars and bless. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's just not all that we think it is. You know, it's like, I'm going to take, 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 take. But in the kingdom, it's give, 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 give. And in the natural, to be seen is to be up here on this platform with a microphone. But to be seen in the kingdom is really just getting in the secret place where no one sees you in this simple devotion where you can see things move. To be seen by God is a verse she just read. You go into your room and shut the door. No one sees you there. No one knows, but God does. In the kingdom, or in the natural, when you think, well, I'm going to go higher, you think, I'm going to go higher? I'm going to go up the ladder? No matter if I'm pushing people under me, I'm going to make it? You go lower so I can go higher. Oh, but in the kingdom, to go higher really looks like this. To go high in the kingdom really looks like going low and going lower still. It's the song that says it's the inside, outside, upside down kingdom. Where you lose to gain and you die to live. And some people may say it doesn't take all of that. So did Peter to Jesus. When Jesus says, oh, I, you know, I'm going to die. I'm going to be resurrected. Da, da, da. He tells them everything that's going to help, going to happen. I'm going to be crucified. And Peter says, far be it from you, Jesus. And you think as a friend, if I was going to tell my friend, hey, I'm about to be crucified. I would pray to God they would be like, yes, woo, yeah. I would pray to God they'd be like, Peter, be like, far be it from you. No, that could never happen to you. But you know what Jesus says? He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me, for you are seen from merely a man's point of view, an earthly point of view. You aren't seen from heaven's point of view. It's different. I want eyes to see the kingdom where, where you lose to gain and you die to live. How am I going to get those eyes? I'm going to get in this. Whoa, Peter, I mean, that's Peter, a friend, a follower of Jesus, and he rebukes him for saying, I don't want you to die. I don't want to see from man's point of view. I want to see from God's. And that's why we can't just compare our lives to other people either to see where we are with God. Because Peter was a friend, a follower of Jesus, ran with Jesus. But he's a man. And he saw from a human point of view. That's why we can't just go every which way. Well, this person's saying this way, so okay. But now it's all love, but it's all love and grace, but it's also just a, um, and it's... Um, we got to be here. we got to be founded on this. So we're not tossed and turned, but we are anchored in the word of God. 
We have to know what this says. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it talks about this. It says, I love Paul. He's really sarcastic. <laughs> he is. Go read it for yourself. And so is Jesus sometimes, and I thoroughly enjoy that. It's <laughs> so Paul comes, and he tells, he says, oh, I wouldn't tell you how great I am like these other men are telling you how great they are. It's basically what he says. He says, but then, of course, they're only comparing themselves to, the, to each other and using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. Paul, I love you. I wouldn't tell you how great I am, but, of course, they're only comparing themselves to each other. They're using themselves as the standard of measurement. And I was reading a commentary on this, and it says they were basically promoting themselves as God to determine what is acceptable and what is not acceptable and feeling okay about it. So it became this idol of themselves to say, well, I can say what is right and what is wrong, and I'm a little better than you, so I feel good about myself. But they were only comparing themselves to each other. There is a standard, and this is it, and it's final. It is final authority. It's the standard. It's what I want to live my whole life to obtain. The word canon literally means measuring stick. It's what I want to measure my whole life off of, not other people, not even friends I'm running with, not the people that's ahead of me, behind me. I want to measure my life to this. Ultimately, and we've got, we've got to do this for a reason. One, because it says if we want to climb Mount God, then we've got to have clean hands and a pure heart. So we have to immerse ourselves, cleanse ourselves. I want to be as close to God as I can be on this earth. And he gives us the opportunity to do that. <laughs> Every day. So I, I want to do that. But also, we've got a job to do. <laughs> we have a job to do here in Cleveland, Tennessee. We have a job to do, and we can't do it without this. We can't do it without him. We can't do it without being there first in our lives. We can't go preach something and not live it. We've got to do it. And again, I'm not preaching this out you. I'm preaching it at myself, and it feels awesome. So, whoo. <laughs> but just one last thing before I close, and Braden, you can come on up. But it's this thing of, it reminds me of the wedding at Cana. And Jesus chooses the stone pots. And most of the time you'd skip over that, but the other day, we were in a group reading it, and I heard somebody share it in the NASB. And it says that these pots were set apart for the Jewish ceremony of purification. And it just jumped off of the page. I grabbed his Bible and started, it's not even my Bible, started marking in it. It's like, sorry, you needed that, I guess. I don't know. But it just blew up in me that the pots he chose were set apart for purification one. Then he commanded the servants, he said, go fill them with water. And it says they didn't just fill them halfway. It says they filled them to the brim. And before I go on, I just want us to really see that. So they're set apart. I mean, I think of me, even as a little girl, I, that was my, my one prayer that I always prayed, and I pray it to this day. Every day is, God, I'm your willing vessel. Do whatever you want to do. I don't want to choose what I get to do. I just want you to be able to get through me. I'm your willing vessel. I mean, I've prayed that every day since I was nine. So let's just think of ourselves as these little pots. <laughs> They're set apart for purification. Set apart for purity. Set apart for righteousness. Then they're filled with water. They're filled with the water of the word. And they're not just filled a little bit with their little one verse a day. No, they are consumed. They are immersed. They're filled to the brim, to the max, with the water of the word. And then 
God turns that water into wine and it's poured out to other people. You know how much I love that? That sometimes when I think about the job that we are called to do and we're supposed to do, it could be overwhelming to think about. But when I think about this, my job is to be set apart for purity, for righteousness, to make sure I'm filled up to the brim. And then God gets to do the rest. He gets to turn that water into wine. He gets to pour his spirit out to other people. People get to be touched because we were simply set apart. Because we simply set apart time every day to get in our word, to get in prayer, to be filled up so we could pour out to other people. The world needs us. Cleveland needs us to be full. People are thirsty. People are hungry. I want to make sure I have something to give them. I want to make sure God has something in me that he can use, (laughs) that he could get through. I want to make sure that I'm not so full of things of the world that I don't have room for this. I want to make sure I'm so full of this that there's no room for the world. (laughs) Come on, Cleveland needs us to be full we have a job to do and it starts with this it simply simply starts with simple devotion (laughs) but it, it does it's getting before God every day can I read just one more verse to you I wasn't going to share this but I feel like to do it It's Philippians 3.14. No, 3.8. It says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Come on. I've discarded everything else is worthless compared to knowing him. Whether I go out and pour out to anybody else, whether I am just in my home, in my closet, everything else in this world will never satisfy. Everything else is garbage compared to knowing him. To, and that word right there, it's not just talking about just reading and, and, and just going through the motions. It's talking about an intimate encounter. It's talking about relationship, (laughs) that you know him and he knows you. Can I say something? This is so powerful. That was awesome. Ladies, oh. (laughs) <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm like so stirred in my heart right now. There's so many things happening. You know, let me say this. The church is not a building. The church is a people. And when the building was taken away, your relationship should not have been. You know what I'm saying? When the building and the services were taken away in 2020, the relationship with Christ with Jesus should not have been. Now, and I say that I was in Ohio this past week sharing some stories that God did personally in my life when I first got saved. When I first got saved, I was praying through a psalm, Psalms 132. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for your presence to dwell. I went into a vision, it was up my bedroom, it had idols, and the Lord spoke to me out of 2 Corinthians 6, if you deal with the idols, I will come, and I will dwell in you, and I will walk among you. You know the verse, right? So I did that. As I'm saying that, I had, I hosted God's presence in my bedroom for two years. I had some of the wildest encounters with God I've ever had, right? And then I, and I, would, I made this statement, and whenever I made it, I knew it was like, whoa. I said, the greatest words from God or the greatest encounters I've ever had, I've been all by myself. 
And then I realized a lot of the people in the room could not say the same thing. The greatest word they've ever heard came from a preacher, or the greatest experience they've ever had came at an altar, at a worship service, or something like that. And I'm like, whoa, God wants to be with you. I'm, and I, no, no, no. And I want everybody in this room and everybody watching online to, to realize He wants to speak to you. He wants to reveal things to you. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 talks about, I wanted to give you meat, but you weren't mature enough so I could only give you milk, you know? I wanted to give you meat, but but you weren't mature so I could only... Listen, I'm blown away by this. When I was reading this one time, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, milk, no, wait, yeah, milk is meat processed by somebody else. Milk is meat that's been processed by someone else, okay? You, you know what I'm saying? When, when, when we had our kids and they were feeding, they were eating milk or meat that had been processed by the mom, by Lauren. Does that make sense? No, he wants to give you meat that's not been processed by someone else. He wants to speak to you himself. The word of God and prayer. And by the way, that was an amazing plug for my book, Simple Devotion. I don't, I, honestly, I don't even know if we sell them right now. We don't even sell them, so you can't buy it. Sorry. Well, I'm sure you can buy it somewhere, but you can't buy it tonight. So it's not an advertisement for a book. But it is a word that God wants to dwell with you in your home. I didn't, listen, when we were in pre-service prayer, this was a really random word, but I feel like I got a word for you. Very short, very simple. Luke 19, uh, verse 5 and 6. I want to read this, and then we can... Uh, we can go do something else. You can go pray. That's what you can do. Luke 19. Oh, shout. There you go. Luke 19, verse 5. It says, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, he saw him, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at your house. Oh, what a word. That's not this house. That's your house. You know what I'm believing for? Revival in your living room. Revival in your living room. Make haste. Come down. Today, I'm coming to your house. Today, I'm coming to your house. Today, I'm coming to your house. Household revival. Listen, I can't say this enough. I don't want the only prayer life you have to be corporate prayer. I don't want the only word life that you have to be when you come and you hear a man of God give you the word. No, you get in your own prayer time, or you have your own prayer time. Now, hold on, I don't want it to, we're not. When I first, when I first said, you know what, I'm going to pray an hour every single day by myself, I'm going to pray an hour every single day. I prayed my heart out for three minutes, and I had 57 minutes to go. And I'm like, this is not going well. But you know what I did? I disciplined myself. That discipline ultimately became a desire. Those who run... Listen, nobody ran, well, I'm sure somebody did, but they're, they're unusual. Nobody ran a 5K or a 10K when they first got started and said, oh, wasn't that awesome? You know what I mean? No, they disciplined, them, them, they disciplined themselves. Nobody went to the gym and bench pressed 500 pounds first. No, they disciplined themselves, and then they begin to desire it. You know those people who exercise, who love it? What a weird crew, you know? 
They were like, oh, exercise, you gotta go to the gym. It's so amazing. It started with discipline, then it became a desire. It's the same with the word and prayer. I desire to go pray. I'm telling, I'm I like, and I'm not being facetious. I like to pray. I like to get in my word. This was uh, when we were at Spring Ramp in Hamilton. I was reading 1 Peter 1, just reading it by myself. And tears started streaming down my face. Why? Because just like Jeremiah, the word was found and I did eat it. And it was the joy and the rejoicing of my life. Ladies, when you became pregnant, your appetite changed. When I was born again, my appetite changed. I don't want the things of the world. I want the things of the kingdom. I want the things of the spirit. Here's here's the way that we're going to end tonight. I want you to do a little bit of self-reflection, introspection. Do you have a consistent, private prayer life. If you cannot, without hesitation, say yes, you need to make some adjustments. You need to make a commitment, make a vow, and then go do it. Expect distractions. Seriously, expect them. They're going to come. I think I said this the other day. Why do I fast? I don't know, because every time I fast, donuts, uh, flesh, and devils show up. And so does God. Amen. <laughs> Listen, let me say this. Do you have a consistent word life? Again, not when you're coming to the ramp or you're coming to ISO or you're coming and you're hearing someone else teach the word. That's milk. It's been processed by somebody else. No, God wants to speak to you off the pages of your Bible. Do you have a consistent word life? When we wrote Simple Devotion, the subtitle is Answering the Radical Call. Listen, we we think that the radical call that Jesus has called us to do the spectacular, and he has. Jesus has called you to do the spectacular, But you know how that happens? Through a life of every single day following Him. You answer the radical call through a lifestyle of simple devotion. Reading your Bible and praying. Matthew 6, 6, and when you do it, your Father, number one, the Bible says, your Father who is in secret. You ever thought about that? Matthew 6, 6 says, your father's in secret. He's in secret. And when you, listen, he is drawing you to himself. And then he says, and when you come in here, I want you to shut the door. Hello. He's got some things that he wants to talk to you about. And they're not bad. Well, some of them may be. But it's all going to be out of a place of truth and love. And then it says this, and your father who sees, your father who's in the secret place will reward you openly. He will reward you openly. Amen? Listen, if you can't answer those questions, do I have a consistent private prayer life or do I have a consistent private Bible study life? Listen, it's just time to make a few adjustments. It's, it's, not, it's not super, super hard. It's like, well, I don't understand the Bible, therefore I don't read it. Start reading it. And let the author talk to you. You know what I'm saying? The best teacher, the guy who wrote it. I'm serious. The best teacher, the one who wrote it, wants to talk to you. Wants to and it's, listen, it's not just talk to you. You're transformed by the word. Transformed your mind. Renew your mind, you know? I love it. Listen, do y'all appreciate the ladies? I appreciate the ladies. The Lord spoke to me 
many, many years ago about how I was walking through our, our room and the Little Mermaid was playing in our house. This was like eight or nine years ago. And I heard that sea witch say, it won't cost you much, just your voice, right? And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, that's what the fight's all about. Ariel is in Isaiah 29. It means lioness of God. The lionesses of God, the enemy has tried to steal their voice. Listen, I, the three fastest growing churches in the world are Iran, Afghanistan, and China. Iran, Afghanistan, and China. You know who's leading the movement? Women. In Muslim nations, women are leaving, leading the movement. And you know what they say to us? You're still fighting over whether or not women can teach and preach, and women are leading the movement in our countries. We need to find something else to fight about, amen? Or, or not. Let's just surrender and relinquish control unto the Lord. All right, let me pray over you. I feel like I've, I just, that was burning in my heart. Oh, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at your house. Come on. Abide at my house. Oh, I almost gave my address. Probably not going to do that. Not over. No, I don't want to do that. But come to my house. You know my address. And if Sean Bowles were here, he would know it too. And just, never mind. Verse number six, and he made haste and he came down and re he received him joyfully. Come on. Jesus wants a date with you in your house. Schedule it with him. Oh. Amen? Was that awesome? All right. Father, I pray that you seal this by the Holy Ghost. The seeds of truth, seal it, Lord, and let it be fruitful. Let it multiply. Lord, I pray that the seed brings forth fruit and there is great fruit and that fruit remains. Lord, I pray, God, that they answer the call to follow you. I pray, God, that you put an appetite in them, an appetite for prayer, for intimacy with you, for a, 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 for a word life in Jesus' name for prayer in the word. Lord, I pray for a grace to come on them, a grace to pray, a grace to get in the word. Reveal to them mysteries out of your word that will blow their mind. Give to them the meat of your word. Oh, come on, somebody. Because here's the deal. I feel so much passion from the Lord. That's what he desires to do. We change the way that we think about God. He's not withholding from you. No, He longs to give to you. Amen? I want to hear testimonies of the way that God speaks to you personally. Again, I'm telling you, the greatest words I've ever received from God, I was by myself. The greatest encounters that I'm like, you know what? They can take a lot of things away from me, but they can't take that away. They can't take an experience away. We can argue things intellectually, but they can't take when I was by myself and God showed up. Amen? All right. I love you. Go get Simple Devotion wherever it's sold. I apologize. I don't know. Hey, I did see one at McKay's a few months ago, and that was when I felt like I had arrived, amen? I had arrived when my book was in a used bookstore. All right, I love you. God bless you. I'll see you next Tuesday.